Japan and Korea, two countries often brought up in the same breath due to the deep ties between the cultures, locations, histories, and so on. The two languages are also similar enough to the point where many sentences can be translated one-to-one -one between both languages, with only small differences at a basic or intermediate level. Both also first received writing from China, and developed somewhat similar methods of using Chinese characters, or hanzi, for their respective languages. In Korea, the term for Chinese characters, hanzi, was naturalized to hanja, while in Japan it became kanji. Eventually, during the 1500s in Korea, King Sejong created the Hunmin Jeongum alphabet, which would go on to become the modern Hangul alphabet we know today. Meanwhile, Japan naturally developed two different syllabaries derived from Chinese characters, one through the cursive form of some kanji, and another through writing only a part of said character. However, these new scripts didn't just end up replacing Chinese characters. Far from it. These scripts were used alongside Chinese characters in a style known as mixed script. Here, the native script of each language is shown in blue, while the Chinese characters are shown in red. However, come the late 20th century after World War II, and great changes to both the governments and educational institutions of both countries, both Koreas would drop the use of hanja, while Japan modified and standardized its list of kanji and still uses them to this day. This leads to two common questions from learners of both languages. Why did Korea drop hanja? And why didn't Japan drop kanji? Now, in order to best answer that question, I'm going to have to give some historical context for it. We aren't certain of when Chinese characters were first introduced into the Korean peninsula, but when they were, they weren't adapted to the language, because Chinese, especially the Chinese used around the time Korean adopted writing, was highly isolating in nature. See, many morphemes in classical Chinese were monosyllabic, and most morphemes could be used as individual words. See the words for country and person on screen now. Now we can combine these to make the compound word compatriot, but while this is one word, what's really important is that it's made up of two different morphemes, both of which are one syllable long. Chinese also made a limited use of inflections, so unlike in English or German, where a verb would change form, the classical Chinese verb would stay the same. Notice how the only thing that changes are the pronouns in the classical Chinese example. Chinese characters had developed to match a language like this, so the majority of Chinese characters would be one syllable long and have a specific meaning attached to it. Now if Korean functioned in a similar way to Chinese, they might have had a much easier time adapting Chinese characters to their own language. Instead, it has many multisyllabic morphemes. Compare the words on screen right now. Korean words would also inflect, though they didn't show person like in Western European languages, but politeness, mood, and tense instead. Korean also possesses many little grammatical markers called particles that mark a word's role in a sentence. So here, ga marks I as a subject, and rul marks fruit as the object. In classical Chinese, word order is what determines a word's role in a sentence. So I eat an apple is different from an apple eats me. The word before the verb is the do of the action, while the word after is affected by the action itself. So swapping the word's positions changes the meaning, but not in Korean, where swapping the positions does nothing, and you'd have to swap the particles as well. With these massive differences between the two languages, and Chinese characters being optimized to represent Chinese, one can see how hard it would be to adapt the script to Korean. And later on, when the Japanese started to learn to write, they encountered similar problems to the Koreans before them, due to how similar Japanese and Korean were, and still are. So how did the Koreans and Japanese adapt Chinese characters to write their own languages? Well, they didn't actually. Not originally. Instead, they just learned to read and write and speak Chinese. The Records of the Three Kingdoms, a history of the three historical Korean kingdoms, was written in classical Chinese by Koreans. The Nihon Shoki, or Nihongi, is a piece of historical literature that would set the beginning of the Japanese cultural, religious, and ideological identity, and was written in classical Chinese, not Japanese. Of course, at this point, learning to read and write was generally reserved for the upper class or religious figures who had the time to learn. But still, for a long time, Korean and Japanese had no writing system, as they hadn't adopted the Chinese characters for their own use yet. Over time, however, 
both the Koreans and the Japanese did start attempting to adopt Chinese characters to better represent their own respective languages, through a few different but similar methods. One of these methods, called Gugyol in Korea and Kanbun in Japan, was to annotate the original text so one could mentally rearrange the sentence into the same word order as Korean or Japanese. Then they would be able to read the text out in their own native language. Without the annotation markers, the sentence would still be normal classical Chinese, but by adding the annotations, Japanese and Korean readers would have an easier time parsing the meaning of the sentence. Another method was to use Chinese characters for the given phonetic value in a system known as Rebus. Rebus as a concept wasn't new at this point. After all, it's the basis for the modern segmental scripts descended from Egyptian. It's also used in Chinese for loanwords, like the Buddhist term Nirvana becoming Chinese Nepan, or to construct new characters, like how the character for horse, Ma, lends its pronunciation to the compound character for mother, Ma. In Korea, two systems came out of this method, Idu and Hyangchal. In Idu, native words, particles, and conjugations were written with characters for the phonetic value, while Sino-Korean words used their semantic value and were read with a Sino-Korean reading. Let's look at two examples. The first is the old Korean word birok, meaning although. The first character means must or have to and is pronounced as pil, while the second character means in or at a certain time or place, and was pronounced as u. Neither of these characters lend their meaning to the word pirok as a whole, instead only giving us a hint towards the pronunciation of the word itself. The second example is the phrase with a man or with the man. The first two characters make up the word man or namja, which is a loan word from Chinese. Hence, the characters do actually represent the word they are writing. The last character means fruit, but it is used here instead to represent the sound of the particle for with, wa. Hyangchal, a derivative of Idu, followed many of the same practices, but there were two things unique to Hyangchal. First, some characters could be read as their native Korean equivalent, meaning they were used for the semantic and not the phonetic value like the character for total here. Its Sino-Korean reading was kwe, but in Hyangchal it could be read as the Korean kabuk. For words with two syllables, like the old Korean word for country, narak, the first character would show the word's meaning, while the second character would match phonetically with the word's last syllable. Unfortunately, Hyangchal wasn't very widespread, with idu being used more commonly instead. In Japan, the rebus principle yielded manyogana, where a character would be used for its given phonetic value, just like in Idu. But unlike in Idu, where both phonetic and semantic characters were used, Manyogana was mainly phonetic, with only a few semantic characters for common words. So each character in the sentence represents a phonetic reading, except the last character in blue, which is the kanji for C, and hence read as one word, Umi. Now obviously, these historical writing systems are cool, but they aren't the main focus of this video. I only mention them to show how deeply ingrained hanja and kanji are in both Korean and Japanese history. Plus, I spent a lot of time researching them and needed an excuse. So whether it be using the characters to write classical Chinese or using the characters for their properties to write their own language, Chinese characters play an important role in Japanese and Korean history. Most importantly, these methods were still in use until the 20th century, meaning they were used concurrently alongside Hangul in Korea, which was created by King Sejong in the 1500s, as well as Hiragana and Katakana, which descended from Manyogana in Japan. Come the 20th century, however, and mixed script would become the norm in both Korea and Japan. In Korea, Hanja was used for Sino-Korean words only, while native words, non-Chinese loan words, and conjugations were written in Hangul. In Japan, kanji was used for the content words, while hiragana was used for particles, conjugations, as well as some native words, while katakana was used for non-Chinese loan words. Now let us fast forward to post-World War II Japan and Korea, and further attempts at reforming both languages. In Japan, there was a push by various groups to modernize the Japanese writing system, 
and to drop kanji entirely, replacing it with either kana or romaji. And yes, you see that right, the early romaji attempts had no spaces in between the words. In fact, the first standardized list of kanji, the toyo kanji, were created with the intention of slowly eliminating the script from Japanese entirely. However, there was immediate pushback against this reform by both nationalists and other groups. Because of that pushback, the Japanese government reversed course and standardized mixed script usage instead, though they still kept the Toyo Kanji list and simplified some of them to make them easier to write. Part of the reason there was so much pushback against eliminating kanji from Japanese was partly due to the fact that in Japan, education was fairly high before and during World War II, which meant people grew up learning to read and write with kanji. They were used to it, and it became a part of the language, a part of their individual culture, and hence, a part of their national identity itself. So what about Korea? South Korea especially? Well, after the Koreans were freed from occupation, schools were set up to teach writing, and mixed script was the main way many learned to write at first. However, Korea ended up passing laws to fully draw Panja from use. And while there was pushback against these laws, with there being a back and forth of outlying, then reinstating and outlying Hanja again, in the end, South Korea decided to drop Hanja from mass education, instead delegating it to special optional classes until quite recently. So why did the pushback against reform fail in Korea while it succeeded in Japan? Well, nationalism, ironically enough. See, while Hanja has a huge history in Korea, during the occupation, Korean literacy dropped significantly. So unless you were upper class or were lucky enough to learn to read and write before or during the war, the masses never had a chance to form as tight a bond with Hanja as the Japanese did with kanji. Also, during the occupation, because the Koreans were forced to learn Japanese, Chinese characters in mixed script had grown to be seen as a tool or remnant of Japanese influence. However, that doesn't mean Hanja has disappeared from Korea entirely. Because if you remember, I mentioned that there was a period after the war where people learned mixed script. Plus, the history and importance of Hanja to Korea means that you can still see Hanja all over the place. In front of bathrooms, you'll see these two characters, the Hanja for man and woman. If you look on menus in restaurants or the clothes sizes, you might see these characters for big, medium, and small. One of the most popular South Korean ramyun brands has Hanja on it. Dictionaries are full of Hanja next to the main entries. Place names and personal names are replete with Hanja. Also, I said previously that there was a back and forth of mixed script, then Hangul exclusivity, then mixed script, then Hangul exclusivity again. Well, that back and forth is still going on. In fact, one of the biggest reasons why some people want to bring Hanja back now is due to the high number of Sino Korean homophones. All of these loanwords you see on screen are borrowed from Chinese. In Chinese, they all have different pronunciations, but in Korean, they are all pronounced as sudo. So using hanja would be helpful in differentiating them. In fact, this is one of the reasons why knowledge of hanja in a law is so important. So in many texts about laws, you'll find hanja in parentheses next to the word in hangul, or vice versa, or just straight up mixed script being used. But outside of specialized fields, hanja isn't really needed, as context can often help differentiate words well enough. And if they can't, then another word with a similar meaning could be used instead. Recently, there also appears to be a small resurgence of parents signing the children up to take hanja classes, with the reasoning mentioned above, and the belief that they will help the child get ahead in life, as well as better connect them to traditional Korean culture in an increasingly westernized East Asia. This, plus more government action to implement Hanja back in schools. In the future, Hanja may have a resurgence within South Korea again. Probably not in mixed script usage, like in Japanese or how Korean used to be written, but to an extent nonetheless. So there you have it. The real reason why Korean dropped Hanja, while Japanese retained kanji, was because of their respective national, personal, and cultural identities, as well as a dose of linguistic nationalism. And if you don't believe people would place such importance on a writing system, just know that South Korea has a day celebrating the invention of Hangul. Anywho, thanks for watching.